right. Praise the Lord. Boy, that is true. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Of course, he doesn't have to because <laughs> he's perfect, all right? We're the ones that have to change. All right, that's another message. Uh, I know I, started, <laughs> I shared that with you before. Um, if you were asked to use one word that would describe what it takes to get the job done, to go on with God or move to the next level in Christian life, that word would have to be relentless. How many of you want everything God has for you? We all do, right? Well, if we were gonna get everything God has for us, certainly you realize that there's gonna be opposition to anything that God places, and I'm, for lack of a better word, a dream in our, in our heart for in the kingdom. And if you're not relentless, uh, when the enemy challenges you, it's gonna, it's gonna knock you off course every time because the enemy loves to intimidate you and to beat you down. And if you're not relentless, you'll begin to think, well, I may not have what it takes. Uh, I may not be able to do this. So I want us to look today at a story in the Bible. And it's in the Old Testament, and it is the story of the Shunammite woman and the prophet Elisha in 2 Kings 4. Uh, this story has tremendous information about what it takes to never give up in life and to be relentless in our pursuit of God, which is what it takes in this world of opposition that we're in today for sure. Second Kings chapter four, I'm gonna begin reading at verse eight. Now, it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem where there was a great woman. And I love the way the scripture describes her as being great because you are aware that you could be beautiful and not be great. You could be smart and not be great. You could be successful uh, and not be great. Because in order to be great, it means that you have learned how to draw on great resources in life. And to be great, you have to learn to draw on great resources in life. And she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. And when he called her, she stood there before him. And Elijah said to Gehazi, say now to her, look, you've been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. I don't know if she was old, but her husband's old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elijah had, Elijah had told her. Now, when the child was grown, it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head, so he said to a servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him, he brought him to his mother. He sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him and went out. Now, 
how does the story end? Well, verse 36, and he called Gehazi and he said, call this Shunammite woman. So he called her and when she came in, he said, pick up your son. So she went in, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. So the conclusion of the matter was she gave God praise and glory, and then she took her boy home alive. I want you to say with me, never give up. Never give up. All right, let's say it again. And this time, I want you to, when we say it, I want you to think about some area of your life that is most challenging or most troubling or you have the greatest adversity in. Just, just close your eyes and speak to it and say, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. That is the attitude of this woman. The classic understatement of life is that life can be challenging. And probably the next uh, most understated uh, area of life is that um, if you're going to the next level with God, uh, life can get overwhelming. Strange, I want to talk to you about a strange little tool that God uses in our lives to take us to the next level, to foster in us change in attitude and, and pursuit of, of, of maturity and fullness in him. It's, it's, it's a very unique little tool. And, and when, I, when I say it to you, you'll probably say, really? Uh, yeah, it, 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 is, it is crisis. God uses crisis in our lives to affect us in, in ways that, that we need to be affected that we won't naturally go to on our own. It, at your leisure, I'd like for you to read the first eight verses of the fourth chapter of 2 Kings. It's about a woman who is so impoverished that her creditors are about to come and take her two sons and sell them into slavery to pay her debts. The prophet Elisha comes on the scene and he asks her, do you have any vessels that can hold oil? He said, go get all your vessels and she did. And Elisha filled them up with oil and said to her, all right, go sell all of that oil and take the proceeds and pay your bills so that your sons don't have to be lost. Now, that woman was in crisis because of what she didn't have. The Shunammite woman, on the other hand, was in crisis, and she had everything in life. She had a great husband who could provide for all the needs. As a matter of fact, uh, they were so successful that they were able to build an extra room onto their house in order for the man of God to use when he travels by to have some comfort. But she was also unfulfilled and frustrated because she had no child. Her crisis couldn't be solved by, by money. Although she was very successful and many other areas of life. In this one area of life, she was in crisis. I say that to you because I want you to understand that it, it is in this area of void where God comes to work in your life with his power. It is in that void that crisis creates in us where God moves in to show himself mighty in our life. Because God has no interest in filling the areas of our life that are already full. He wants to fill those places in our life that are empty, that are depleted, that are, that are, that are hungry. And he wants to say to us in, in, in stories like this, look, you don't, you don't have to accept defeat. You, you don't have to accept failure. You don't have to allow the enemy to come into your life 
and steal the dream that God has placed in you for your life or your family. Because like Paul says in Philippians 1, uh, he who has begun a good work in you, everybody say God, that's who he's talking about. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So when God wants to move you into the greatness that he's prepared for you, you're gonna find unusual opposition coming against you. Therefore, you must make room for great resources. Great people make room for great resources because you're only as great as the resources that you draw from. The word of God is a great resource. Have you made room for the word of God? This woman, the word of God spoken through the man of God is what changed her life and gave her great resources to solve the crisis in her life. And, and in this story, we find three opportunities. Of course, you know there would be three. Three opportunities for her to fail. Uh, three opportunities for her to give up. These are the same opportunities the enemy offers us today, very subtly, to give up, to quit, let it go. It's not that important anyway, is it? Opportunity number one, you bury the dream in your heart. Now, this is the place where many people fail just by burying the dream in your heart and no longer pursuing it. Let me encourage you. Don't, don't be afraid to let your dream out. I mean, don't be afraid to face the discomfort of wanting something from God. Does it make you feel uncomfortable to want something from, from God? To reject the, 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 the temptation to tell yourself that it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. Look at verse 13. And Elijah said to Gehazi, say now to her, look, you've been concerned with us, c concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? Hey, uh, do you need me to introduce you to the president or the CEO or some of these military officers? Hey, uh, would it help you to get a little exposure in life? And she responds, my family takes good care of me. Yeah. I live, I, I live among my people. Now, I know that it's hard to read that phrase. <laughs> I live among my people. It sounds arrogant, really, doesn't it? But I don't think it's as much arrogance as it is confidence. By, she's saying to him, look, I, I have all I, I need. I, I don't need anything else, which really reveals a certain aspect of her character because she's basically saying, look, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a manipulator. I mean, I didn't build this, my, my husband and I didn't build this room on the wall for you so that we could use you. Because people do that, people use you. I mean, some people are only with you as long as they can get something out of you. But she was saying, I'm not trying, I, I, don't, I don't have a need, I'm not trying to get you to do something, I don't have a hidden agenda People that are manipulators usually have a hidden agenda and their blessings don't last very long because before you know it, they are devoured by their own agenda. But this, this, this Shunammite woman said, I dwell among my own people. So let me, let me show you two defeating attitudes that come in you and happen in you when you bury your dream in your heart. The first one is, is hiding behind the mask. Ta-da! church face. <laughs> yeah. Everything's great. Uh, it's wonderful. How many of you are aware that God sees behind the mask? Yes. He saw you when you put it on and he can see through masks. So what does God do? God reveals to Gehazi, the servant. She didn't say it to him. Nobody told him about it. At least it's not recorded in the word. It's just like God told Gehazi, hey, I know she looks confident and I know she seems satisfied with her life. And she said she doesn't need anything, but she does have a need. And the need is she is, she is 
lonesome. She is longing for a child in her life. So she's hiding that great need behind the mask of confidence. In verse 14, so Elijah said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So when we bury our dream in our heart, we often hide behind a mask of confidence as if we don't really have a need. The second defeating attitude of burying your dream in your heart is accepting failure as the final answer. Verse 15, so he said, call her. When he called her, she stood in the doorway. Verse 16, then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Elisha, I love you, I believe in you, but don't make me think it's possible for me to have a son. I, I put that dream to sleep long ago. Man of God, don't wake that thing up in me again. I have finally packed away my feelings. I've finally packed away the accusation of my own heart that I'm the reason I can't have my own child. I've carried this bundle forever and I finally got it settled down. So please don't make it, wake it up again. And don't bring that desire alive in me again. It's too painful. So many times, this is where we get locked into less. After having doors shut in your face, you've been, you've been put down, uh, put out, you know, put away in life. You finally tell yourself, look, maybe it's just not meant to be. Maybe I just thought about this. Maybe this was my idea. Maybe God didn't speak this to me. Maybe God didn't lead me into this. Maybe it was, it was just me. But verse 17 says, but the woman conceived and bore a son when the appropriate time had come of which Elijah had told her. So in spite of her timidity, in spite of her fear of letting this dream come alive again, the word of God took root in her life and broke her cycle of, of mishandling this pain and she got her baby, which gives her her second opportunity to give up. And it is when you experience long-term favor. Now, I know that sounds weird, but let me explain it to you. She had long-term favor. You say, how do you know she had long-term favor? Well, look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, now when the child was grown. So it means that the child is at least uh, 13 years old or so because that's bar mitzvah age. That's when you become a man in the Jewish culture. And of course, this was a, in that region of the world. So the child, I mean, there's nowhere in the Bible that tells you exactly how old the child was. The only thing you know is he wasn't old enough to go out there with the reapers yet. But when his father was out there, he could go to the reapers, but he couldn't just work out there among them. He wasn't old enough for that. But he was grown to the point that the Bible says he was uh, mature. So let's just say, let's just call him 13 years old. So when he gets to be that age, he goes out to his father who is out among the reapers. And this may sound contradictory, what I'm about to say, but sometimes the most difficult thing to deal with in our life is a long period with no trouble. Because when you have no trouble, you're tempted to believe that everything is complete and you're able to only accept something that is partially complete because the lack of trouble and the lack of disturbance tells you, hey, I'm here. <laughs> I've made it. I've arrived. And when you think you've arrived, you're not looking for anywhere else to go. Then trouble comes. And when trouble comes, it just knocks the wind out of your sails. I mean, have you ever been there? Have you ever been between a rock and a hard place? I mean, like the, the rock of intimidation and the hard place of frustration. 
and you feel like you're just being boxed around by every situation, and it's not that you're so strong that you're still standing, it's the fact that you just don't have anywhere to fall. I mean, you're backed into a corner, and, and life is just battering you. Well, verse 19 says, and he said to his father, the boy goes out, he, he's out with his dad, he says to his father, my head, my head. So he said to the servant, carry him to his mother. Now, this is smart old papa here because he says, take him to his mama because when you have trouble with your dream, you must take it back to the one who carried it because no one fights harder for the dream that is alive than the one who carried it. Because if you've struggled to carry this dream for a long time and you have gone through the valley of the shadow of death, so to speak, to birth this dream out, you're not gonna let it die easily. If you wanna know what would cause you to be relentless and radical, just, just carry something through hell and high water and then uh, uh, watch someone take it away from you. It'd be like, oh, no, you don't, devil. No, no, oh, no, you don't. I went through too much with this. No, I, 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 I'm gonna fight you tooth and nail over this. I'm gonna fight. I'm not gonna give up without a fight, and I'm not gonna fight fair. By the way, have any of you ever been in a real fight? I mean, like, a, like you really actually physically got in a fight with somebody? The reason I'm asking you is because if any of you ever been in a fair fight, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I just dawned on me when I said I'm not going to fight fair. I don't know anybody that's been in a real fight that ever fought fair. I mean, you jowls and eyes, you pull a nose, you, you know, you're hitting in the neck. I mean, you, you're doing anything you can to stop somebody. Well, are there any mamas in the house? Now, I know, yeah, you say, well, yeah, I am. No, I, no I'm not talking about in terms of gender. I'm talking about in terms of relationship. I mean, have you, have you ever birthed anything? I mean, have you, have you carried something? Have you carried a dream? I know, it, I know John has. I mean, we got I heart macaroni that's just blowing and going. I mean, who carried that? Who birthed that? I mean, it, it was his dream. It was his, it was his vision. It was a, a direction he felt he had from the Lord. Well, he's the mama. He, he carried it. He's the one that birthed it through great struggle and great trial and great effort. So when, when, you, when you carry something and when it's finally birthed out, you can't just stand there and watch it fall apart. So smart papa says, when something happened to him, take him t to his mama because mama's going to do everything she can to make sure nothing happens to him. Verse 20, when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. So in spite of her relentless, tenacious attitude, no matter how bad she wanted it, with all of her efforts, to change the situation, the boy died. Now, that's one of the problems I have with theologies, and there are many of them out there that teach you that if you have enough faith, nothing bad is going to happen in life. The truth is, every story doesn't have a happy ending where everybody lives happily ever after. Sometimes when you've done everything, you've named it, you've claimed it, you know, you've, you've believed for it, you've, uh, uh, you've planted seeds, uh, you know, any other word you can use for that, it still dies. Now, here's an interesting change in attitude in this woman when the boy dies. Do you remember at first, she had buried the dream in her heart the boy was dead in her heart. And it was okay with her for him to stay dead in her heart because she had packed it away. And it was all right if God didn't bring that dream alive in her heart. But now, after the dream has been brought to life 
and she has experienced it and she has interacted with it and she had watched him grow and develop and to then have him stolen away by, by, by death, this woman's attitude was completely, de- no, no, you don't, devil. I mean, I'm not accepting this. Verse 21, and she went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God and she shut the door upon him and went out. This little mama picks up her boy. He's dead. She's carrying dead weight. Have you ever carried dead weight? It seems a whole lot heavier than, than weight that's trying to help you in some way. She carries this dead weight. This is why I don't really care for people who don't care about me to pray for me. Because sometimes if you're gonna pray for me, you're gonna be carrying dead weight. I mean, I'm gonna be stinking at, at times. I mean, I don't do all, all things right. And sometimes you have to carry me through a lot of stuff. Mom carries him, puts him up. Um, verse 22, then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I might run to the man of God and come back. I'll be back, she said. You know, you have to have that I'll be back in your spirit. If you, if, if you don't have that, that I'll be back in your spirit, then uh, you're gonna give up on your dream and you're gonna miss the opportunity to see God work and you're gonna miss the opportunity to experience him. Sometimes you just need to say to the devil, devil, I'll be back. I mean, I, I know they took the car. Uh, I know they stole my business. I know uh, I lost my house, uh, but I'm, I'll be back. Uh, I, I'm, I'm coming back tenacious, verse 23. So he said, why are you going to him today? Dad's saying to mom, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. Honey, why, why are you going today? It's not a good day to travel. And besides, you know, we, we, got, we need to plan a funeral here. And she basically says, uh, you need to plan a funeral. I need a donkey. It is well, she says. Then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, drive and go and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. She goes to the man of God because this is where it started with a word from God. So that means it ain't over till God says it's over. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, please run now and meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it's well. I mean, can't you just see this? Here comes Gehazi running down to meet her and greet her. He's gonna have a little small talk with her. Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? And she basically, she just moves right past him, just fast. Just move. I, it, I'm fine, it's fine. I mean, you get the distinct idea that, that she doesn't want to have a conversation with Gehazi because she didn't come to see Gehazi. She came to see the man of God and she's going to the man of God. And this is just a little sidebar uh, when I think about what she did. Uh, she's basically refusing to discuss her problem with somebody who can't help her. So I'm just thinking that's pretty good advice for us, right? You don't need to discuss your problems with somebody that can't help you because all they're wanting to do is meddle in your business, you know, so, so don't waste your time talking to people that can't help you. Just ride right on past them. Now, verse 27, now when she came to the man of God at the hill, that's Mount Carmel, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Elisha said, I don't understand why I didn't already know about this. God's been silent about this to me. So she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? 
And she grabs Elisha's ankles and she says, Elisha, that boy that I told you not to wake up that dream in me is dead. And you got to do something about it. And Elijah said, how old was he? Oh, he was about 13 or 14. Okay, great. Well, the warranty on the blessings of God then have not expired. God started it and God can fix it. So she says, Elijah, you need to do something about it. And Elijah said, the Lord hadn't told me anything about this. Sometimes God puts your help on hold. You say, like what, Pastor? Well, like Lazarus. Sometimes God puts your help on hold because it's not time yet. There's going to be something profited from it if God delays your help coming. Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, sent word to Jesus that his great friend and their brother was sick and it looked like he wasn't going to make it, implying Jesus come and get him and fix him because he's about to die. And what did Jesus do? Jesus waited four days to make sure he was good and dead, that nobody thought that he was just passed out or in swoon, that he was good and dead before he went down to help. Why would Jesus delay help? So that Mary and Martha and all of us and everybody since that, that happened, because it's written in the Word, would know that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Sometimes God delays our help. Verse 29, then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. And if you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, don't answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you so he arose and followed. In other words, you may send Gehazi down there with that stick, but I'm, I'm not leaving you until you go down there. And he, so he said, okay, I'll, I'll follow. Gehazi's young, he can run, take the stick, go down there. Now, the, stick, uh, the staff is a, is, a, is a stick, you know this, right? You've seen staff, I know all of us have. It's, it's just a dead piece of wood, now, a staff in the hand of a man of God that has been anointed with the staff, the staff is powerful. Moses' rod was powerful. Uh, Elisha's staff was powerful when it was in the hands of Elisha. But now it's in the hands of Gehazi, the servant, and Gehazi, verse 31, now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and told him, saying, the child has not awakened. Gehazi takes Elijah's staff and puts the stick on the corpse, a dead thing on a dead thing will only yield a dead thing. This is why if you're having trouble you, you can't make it in a dead church. If you're, if you're all tied up in deadness around you you, 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 you can't experience life. Gehazi laid that dead stick on that boy and it didn't work. People try all kind of stuff and it's not working. Four steps forward, three steps back positive thinking, humming in the lotus position, you know, whatever it might be. Let me suggest to you that you just open your eyes and look to Jesus, the who the Bible says is the author and the finisher of your faith. So Gehazi says it didn't work. Which brings us to the 
last opportunity, the third opportunity that she had to give up. And that is when your miracle doesn't come. She went for help. She got help, but it didn't work. Verse 32, when Elijah came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and he lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child and the flesh of the child became warm. So Elijah goes in. The boy's been there for a while. I mean, remember, enough time has passed for Mama to go to Mount Carmel to get Elisha and for old man Elijah to finally make it back with Mama to the boy. So this boy's been there a while. I'll remind you, there was no air conditioning in this day. Probably not even a fan. I mean, he's by now, certainly stinking. So what Elisha does here is radical. It, it, it's, it's relentless. And the truth is, if you're going to get what others don't have, you're going to have to do what others won't do. So Elisha is on top of him, stinking all, and and then his, and his flesh begins to get warm. Now, I'm just going to encourage you that in the pursuit of God's dream in your life, whatever it might be, it might be about your occupation, it may be about your family, it may be about your life, whatever it is that God has, has, has placed inside of you as a, as a greatness for, in your life that the enemy wants to kill, uh, he's going to be as discouraging as possible and you're going to have all kinds of opportunities to give up on the dream and to quit. And I'm just saying that hit the boy's flesh getting warm is a, is a small thing. I mean, you have to look sometimes for small things. I mean, look, he didn't raise his hand. He didn't stand up. All he did was his skin begin to get warm. Now, the only one who could feel his skin getting warm was the one that was laying on top of him. Others couldn't see it. Nobody would know that anything is happening except the one that's laying there on top of him. So look for little change. Thank God for little change in life. Sometimes it's just a little thing that you go, ooh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. That's just, that just tells me we're still in it. Verse 35, he returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times. Why seven? I, seven is the number of completion. Of course, scriptural numerics, you would say, okay, this is complete healing. The boy's brought back to life. Or it just may mean sometimes it takes a good bit of time to get it out of you. you know? I don't know. So one sneeze wouldn't do it. We had to get seven of them. And the child opened his eyes. So now dead stuff is about to rise up. And he called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite woman. So he called her. And when she came in to him, he said, pick up your son. So she went in, she fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. She comes into the room and before she does anything else, she gives God praise. She humbles herself before God. She gives God glory. The secret to survival is to learn that before you pick up what the enemy stole from you, you give God praise and glory first and then pick up that blessing. 
when she got through praising, she then collected her stuff. So reach in, get the joy, get that peace, get that family, get that career, whatever it is that God has blessed you with. Tell the devil, get your hands off of my stuff. I'm going home. And she took her child and went home. Relentless, radical. I'll be back. Oh no, devil, you're not stealing it from me. I carried it a long time. I birthed it through much pain. I'm not giving up without a fight. That's what it takes for the kingdom of God to be birthed in our life. I can't tell you how many times Pastor Tanya and I were talking about this message yesterday and um, she said, do you think we've given up? And I knew that question was coming because I, I thought about that too. You think we've given up? And I said, well, I haven't given up. I'm still going. Life changes for all of us. Things happen. Circumstances change. Times change. Elements change. All kinds of things change. It's not, a fa it's not a matter of whether you're always doing the same thing. It's a matter of whether you're holding on to what God has given you in life and making whatever adjustments it takes to do what God has called you to do. And see, I know I'm looking into the faces right here of some people that I know your story and I know where you are and I know what it's taken to get you there. And you are a perfect example of this relentless, this pursuit of God. God blesses our lives he has a plan for all of our lives. He has a blessing in all of our lives. And, it, and it's not always uh, give me a lot of money or give me a big house or you know, make sure my family never has any problems. It's, it's not things like that. It, it, it's those things that make us who we are, those things that develop our character and our life and push us forward and create leaders and, and, and faith builders and, and responsible, capable people and move us into the areas of life where maybe, you know, you, you, maybe you're sitting here or you're watching out there and you're saying, man, I've always had a dream for this. I, I've always believed that, you know, that God would, would do this in me or God would take me here or this is a passion that I've pursued. I wanted to pursue. Well, that's what we're talking about. Never give up because God will move us forward. You have to be relentless. And sometimes you have to be radical. <laughs> All right, let's bow our heads. Mm -hmm.